And good morning, everybody, and thank you for being here so early uh, today. So I'm going to be presenting the results of the Cleopatra on behalf of um, the study investigators. And before I start, just some principle. This is the way uh, pertuzumab uh, works. So it binds to HER2, um, to the HER2 receptor, in a similar fashion, uh, in a, in a, so in a similar concept as, as Herceptin does. So this would be Herceptin that binds to this area of the of the HER2 extracellular domain. Pertuzumab, however, binds to the receptor, but it binds to in a different site. And this is the site that is important for the dimerization between HER3 and HER2. So uh, pertuzumab is a dimerization blocker, and therefore it prevents uh, quite efficiently uh, ligand-dependent receptor activator. The two antibodies given together are extremely complementary in preclinical models, and they are synergistic. And we have shown in the past, in patients with uh, more advanced disease, that the two antibodies together were quite active. This was a randomized registration, placebo-controlled phase T study, and the design is shown here, 800 patients, one-to-one -one randomization, placebo plus uh, trastuzumab, uh, plus docetaxel in the control arm, pertuzumab plus trastuzumab, uh, plus docetaxel in the experimental arm. Therapy with docetaxel was given every three weeks, and it was recommended that at minimum six cycles of the docetaxel uh, ought to be administered. And after that, it was left at the criteria of the investigations and the patients to continue or not. On the other hand, uh, either placebo, pertuzumab, or pertuzumab and pertuzumab were given every three weeks until uh, disease uh, progression or side effects. And what you have here is the dosing schedule. Uh, as you can see, pertuzumab is given on a fixed dose. Patients were randomized based on the geographic region. This is a true global study, and also on the prior um, uh, therapy that the patients had received. In particular, if the patients had received uh, prior neoadjuvant um, uh, or adjuvant chemotherapy. In terms of the eligibility criteria, these are all patients with centrally confirmed HER2 positive disease, either by IHC or FISH. <coughs> patients had uh, first line metastatic disease, no prior therapy, with the only exception of one line of hormonal therapy. Patients had measurable or non-measurable uh, disease uh, to be uh, eligible, and patients had to have a good cardiac uh, function. If they had received in the adjuvant setting uh, either taxanes or, um, or um, uh, trastuzumab, uh, more than one year had to be uh, had to elapse before entering into the protocol. The baseline characteristics of the patients are well balanced. Uh, as you can see, the median age is uh, 54 years, which is classical in this patient population. Uh, these are two positive patients tend to be a little younger than other patients with metastatic disease. Uh, well balanced by performance status, well balanced by uh, um, region. What you have here is the HER2 status. All patients but one were positive either by um, HER2 uh, uh, immunostochemistry or uh, FISH. About 50% of patients were uh, ER positive. And also what you have here uh, in the bottom of the slide is the distribution on the percentage of patients that had a visceral disease. Again, classically of HER2 positive disease, the majority of patients, uh, north of 75%, had a visceral disease. And here's the uh, prior uh, chemotherapy in the adjuvant uh, or the adjuvant setting, uh, about uh, 47 uh, 45, 47 percent of patients had received uh, prior um, adjuvant, and you have here in the bottom of the slide uh, the types of chemotherapy that these patients have received in the adjuvant setting. And now to the primary efficacy endpoint that was independently review uh, progression-free survival. And these are the findings. Uh, the control arm had a median time to disease progression of 12.4 months. The experimental arm with pertuzumab, 18.5. That's a six months delta difference, hazard ratio 0.5, and the p value um, is um, um, uh, shown here as well. When it comes to the pre specified subgroups in the study, uh, you see this forest plot here, and um, uh, you can see that um, uh, um, the benefits of pertuzumab were seen uh, across uh, these, uh, um, these variables. 
People question sometimes when they see this data what happens with patients with non visceral disease, in which I don't know if you see it, but uh, there seems to be less of a benefit. I think this relates more to the difficulty, and that's a hypothesis, of measuring bone disease alone, uh, which shows what these patients are. It is hard sometimes uh, in bone disease to uh, really know when these patients are progressing. But if we take this away, all the other parameters are clearly um, favoring pertuzumab. When it comes to uh, survival, the study had a predefined interim analysis at the time of progression-free survival. These results show a strong trend in favor of survival, hazard ratio 0.64, and here you have the p-value. Now, this is not significant because this is an interim analysis, and in order to be significant, it would have to be crossed a pre-specified uh, O'Brien Fleming stopping boundary that is quite stringent, and uh, that was not met. So we need to wait longer to have meaningful survival data. In terms of response, and I'll go very quickly, uh, as you would expect, a higher response rate with the pertuzumab arm from 69% to 80%. And then in terms of side effects, what I have in this slide here are just the side effects that were grade three or greater. And what you see is that in the case of pertuzumab, there is an excess febrile neutropenia a pertuzumab is on the right on this, and then also an excess diarrhea, diarrhea being a well-known side effect of pertuzumab. Of note, the majority of these events occurred during the first six, six cycles when um, docetaxel was being given. There was not a signal of any increased cardiac dysfunction at all in the pertuzumab arm. So in, conclu in conclusion, Cleopatra met its primary endpoint and demonstrated a significantly statistically and clinically meaningful increasing in progression free survival, cancer ratio is 0.62, in patients with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. The progression free survival increased by 6.1 months, and it was consistent across uh, subgroups. And it is supported by, uh, uh, by a strong trend in survival and by improvement in response rate. The combination of pertuzumab, antrastuzumab, and osetaxel <coughs> Um, it did increase diarrhea, rash, and mucosal inflammation, as well as for neutropenia. And this uh, derangement um, may be uh, practice changing in HER2 positive patients in the first line setting. And with this, I'll finish, and I'd like to thank you all for your attention.